the regular town commission meeting of april 26 2022 uh, please rise for the pledge of allegiance to the flag I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please call the roll. Mayor Tompa. Here. Vice Mayor Kersman. Yes. Commissioner Campo. Here. Commissioner Fender. I'm here. Commissioner Mayfield. Here. Okay, that brings us down to item two, proclamations and presentations. The first one is the Arbor Day proclamation. Could you please read the proclamation? In 1872, J. Sterling Thank you very much. I don't believe we have anybody here to uh, receive the proclamation, so we will mail it to Tree City, USA. Uh, the next proclamation is Historic Preservation Month. Please read the proclamation. A proclamation declaring Historic Preservation Month in Sewell's Point, Florida. Whereas historic preservation is an effective tool for revitalizing neighborhoods. is Historic Preservation Month in Sewell's Point. Further, the Commission calls upon the people of Sewell's Point to join their fellow citizens across the United States in recognizing and participating in this special observance. Now, therefore, I, John Tom Peck, Mayor of the Town of Sewell's Point, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2022 as Historic Preservation Month. Thank you very much, and I believe, um, and pardon me if I mispronounce your name, Duet Price. Okay. Uh, yes, I come up and get it. Oh yeah, I, you have a, you have a few words you want to say yeah. first. No, um, yes, once again, thanks again for your support. Um, Dwight Price with the Martin County Historic Preservation Board. Um, every year, you guys provide us this support, and we appreciate it. She mentioned the events that we'll be having for May, which will start on May second um, with our kickoff at the Stuart Heritage Museum. So, you know, feel free to attend. And like she said, there's going to be, you know, schedules of different events throughout the month, um, including a preservationist of the year, which would be May 17th at the Elliott Museum. So once again, thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next 
uh, proclamation is <coughs> Peace Officers Week. Please read the proclamation. A proclamation, Peace Officers Memorial Day. Whereas Congress and the President of the United States have designated May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day and the week in which May 15 falls as National Police Week. And whereas the members of the law enforcement agency of the town of Sewell's Point play an essential role in safeguarding the rights and freedoms of the town of Sewell's Point. And whereas it is important that all citizens know and understand the duties, responsibilities, hazards, and sacrifices of their law enforcement agency. And that members of our law enforcement agency recognize their duty to serve the people by safeguarding life and property, by protecting them against violence and disorder, and by protecting the innocent against deception and the weak against oppression. Whereas the men and women of the law enforcement agency of the town of Sewell's Point unceasingly provide a vital public service. Now, therefore, I, Mayor John Tompeck, Mayor of the town of Sewell's Point, call upon all citizens of the town and upon all patriotic, civic, and educational organizations <coughs> to observe the week of May 11th through May 16th, 2022, as Police Week with appropriate ceremonies and observances in which all of our people may join in commemorating law enforcement officers, past and present, who by their faithful and loyal devotion to their responsibilities have rendered a dedicated service to their communities and in doing so have established for themselves a viable and enduring reputation for preserving the rights and security of all citizens. Now, therefore, I, John Tompak, Mayor of the Town of Sewell's Point, do hereby proclaim May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day in the town of Sewell's Point. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Chief. Would you like to come up? I just want to thank the town of Sewell's Point for recognizing the sacrifices made by law enforcement and specifically memorializing those officers who have lost their lives in the line of duty on Peace Officers Memorial Day on May 15th. And uh, hopefully we'll see the town hall lit up in blue again on uh, National Police Week this year. Okay. I will make it Didn't want to get that much exercise today. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Appreciate it. And our last uh, proclamation is Mental Health Month. Please read the proclamation. A proclamation for Mental Health Awareness Month, May 2022. Whereas <coughs> mental health is key to overall wellness as mental health influences decision making behavior and consequently, consequently physical health. Whereas over half of adults living with mental health illnesses do not seek treatment. Whereas a growing number of youth in the United States live with depression and in fact, about 20% of young people ages 12 to 17 have experienced major depression. In 2022, more than 10% of children and adults continue to lack adequate medical insurance coverage for essential metal, mental health services. Florida is ranked 49th out of 50 states with access to mental health care. The stigma remains the primary obstacle in getting help. Community, as community leaders, we must prepare for an increase in demand on services through education, outreach, and even greater access to care to ensure our community's overall health. Whereas it is the duty of each and every one of us to provide continued and consistent access to resources to mental health care. Whereas the Town Commission of Sewell's Point, Florida, strives to be a community who supports mental wellness, including greater access to treatment, increasing educational tools and resources for our citizens, and continually supporting those citizens with mental health opportunities. Now, therefore, I, John Tom Peck, Mayor of the Town of Sewell's Point, do hereby proclaim May 2022 as Mental Health Awareness Month in the town of Sewell's Point. Thank you very much. I believe we have, is, is Mary Basinger here today? Okay, so we have nobody here to uh, accept the proclamation. So Mary Basinger, the board director of New Horizons, was supposed to be here, I guess. And we'll make sure they get the proclamation. So that brings us to um, Section 3, public comment. And we do have uh, one public comment, Don Weiner. Please come to the podium, state your name, and you have three minutes. Don Weiner, Sewell's Point. Comment on mental health. They seem to refer to me a lot with that. <laughs> um, 
I'm going to talk about briefly about communication. And I'm going to share with you uh, some things that may be helpful. I received this, and without a, I don't want to offend anybody, but it's long, it's wordy, it's small print, and quite honestly, I can only go so far, and I'm not sure how far the residents will go. It calls for things like volunteers, but it doesn't really elaborate on what the volunteers do, or et cetera. I won't go into that. Uh, and I don't mean to um, offend anyone. What I do want to do is I want to hand out an example of the kind of newsletter that we did. Unfortunately, I've only got four copies, so perhaps you can share that. I'll share with you. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> Thanks. People read this. Appreciate it. Well, up here is from yes. the town. Put it together. I think if you look in the Sewell's Point magazine, you see the people that help that. There's probably a lot of potential volunteers there. It has news that people are interested in. It's thinking about their subdivisions and so on and so forth. And all it takes is one on the front to get somebody's attention. It's big, it's colorful, um, and like I say, it talks a lot. One of the things that's been a big uh, pet peeve of mine is lack of communication. There are a lot of things that are said here and a handful of handful of people that come regularly that know what they are. But there are a lot of things that aren't said and a lot of things that may be said, but they don't get out to the public. One of the things that to me is, is not right, it talks in the paper and it talks here about a wonderful $3.4 million grant for the sewer project. Quite honestly, that's terrific. But I don't see anything about the million dollars in matching fund, more or less, that the town has to come up with in one fashion or another. So when people hear this side, it's terrific. When they say, wait a minute, the town's got to come up with roughly a million bucks in some way, shape, or form, that's when they get angry. And that's why communication on all sides can be very helpful. Uh, keeping them informed, and I won't go on much longer. I kind of said enough. But Thank you for listening. Thanks, Don. Thank you. <clears throat> Next is uh, item four. Any uh, additions, deletions, or changes to the agenda? If not, can I get a motion to so move? Six. Please call the roll. Vice Mayor Kurzman? Yes. Commissioner Campo? Aye. Commissioner Fender? Sure. Commissioner Mayfield? Yes. Mayor Tompak? <clears throat> yes. Uh, the next item is the consent agenda, and uh, I was going to recommend that we uh, pull 6 E and F since they're resolutions and move them to uh, section 9, which is resolutions. I think there's some more discussion that's probably required on both of them, so I'd like to do that. Other than that, is there any other changes that uh, anybody would like to make? The finances part of the consent agenda this, this time around? The financials? Yes. 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 Would you like to pull them out if possible? You'd like to pull 6A as well? I just have questions. Okay. All right, so we'll uh, pull 6A. We'll move um, 6 E and F to uh, resolution section item 9. Can I get a motion to uh, approve the revised agenda? Or the second agenda? Please call the roll. Commissioner Campo? Aye. Commissioner Fender? Sure. Commissioner Mayfield? Yes. Mayor Tom Peck? Yes. Vice Mayor Kurzman? Yes. Okay, Commissioner uh, Fender, why don't you go ahead and ask your questions uh, on uh, the financials? About the uh, the format and the reference to abnormal. <coughs> that probably means something to accountants. I would like. I don't know if you all have. Everyone has met Holly Vath. She's been our uh, finance director Hello. since uh, for a couple of months now. So uh, I'll let Holly respond. <coughs> Um, the BSA software, um, this is a standard report that runs from there. So abnormal is the wording that they use. And it just means that it's, um, in our case, we don't, we have one account that basically is over budget. So in the expense area, it would be an account that right now is spent more than budgeted. So whenever we have an, uh, 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 a column that is, Overexpended, it pops in the column header abnormal. Um, it would, it would, 
it's going to be in that form that um, it's either going to be the available balance or if it's in brackets, like the abnormal is in brackets. So if it's in brackets, that means it's um, more or less overspent. So if you go to page, and I don't have the page numbers for your agenda, but the second page of the um, expenditure report, so there's a revenue and expenditure report, and then on the top it says page three of five. Yep. Um, so if you go to engineering services, for example, right now we budgeted $50,000 and we've actually written checks and spent $86,000. Hmm. So we're technically overspent by $36,000. So that $36,000 is in brackets because that's really, it's an abnormal situation right now. Okay. All right. <coughs> Just to add an editorial comment to that, a lot of the, those engineering services are attributable to projects. So I've asked them to go through and delineate those particular expenses that have been incurred in that particular line item and and attribute them to the uh, project expenses rather than engineering services so awesome thank you just one more I, I noticed on those column headers it looks like they don't fit so it's almost like there's words behind the word abnormal that almost look like normal so I, what does that column header actually supposed to say um i i could um look at the program and look at the thing but i think you're right it does say perhaps there might be if it was wider it might say abnormal and then normal yeah <laughs> all right but i'll see if i can figure that out okay i'll move approval of the financial agenda item i'll second please call the roll commissioner fender aye commissioner mayfield yes mayor compact yes mayor vice mayor kersman yes commissioner campo aye Okay, that brings us to uh, item seven, <clears throat> ordinance uh, number 441, lots reduced for public use. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Torsivia, could you please read the ordinance title aloud? An ordinance number 441 is an ordinance of the town commission of the town of Sewell's Point, amending the town of Sewell's Point code of ordinances, subpart B. Land Development Regulations, Chapter 82, Zoning, Article 4, Districts and District Regulations, Division 1 in general, by adding Section 82-203, lots reduced for public purpose, provided for severability, repeal of conflict, codification, and an effective date. Mr. Hudson, you have anything to add? <clears throat> this is the second reading of uh, this particular ordinance, so I'll I move think everything's approval. been said. I'll second. Please call the roll. Commissioner Fender? Aye. Commissioner Mayfield? Yes. Mayor Tompak? Yes. Commissioner Campo? Aye. Vice Mayor Kersman? Yes. Okay, the next item is um, a first reading of Ordinance Number 442, Special Permits for Noncompliant Dock Roofs. Uh, Mr. Torsivium, could you read the ordinance title aloud, please? Yes, ordinance number 442 is an ordinance of the town commission of the town of Sewell's Point, Florida, amending chapter 62, marine activities, facilities, and structures, article three, marine structures, division two, docks. They add a new section 152, providing for special permits for certain non-compliant docks in existence as of June 1st, 2022, from severability, the repeal of laws and conflict, codification, and an effective date. Uh, Mr. Hudson, can you uh, get us moving on this one? Uh, yes, sir, thank you. Um, We've been talking about this for a few times now, and uh, this particular ordinance um, focuses in on uh, the east side of the town, um, where certain docks have had roofs built upon them, and uh, they were not in compliance with the current code. And so following the commission's uh, uh, direction, we, we've drafted the ordinance to create a uh, a procedure to bring those non-compliant docks into into kind of a conforming status so um, I did want to make a couple of comments the way it's drafted the the uh, the dock roofs which receive um, this non the special non-conforming status would be allowed to be rebuilt if they are damaged um, as it is drafted no additional permits are being considered at this time you know this uh, reflects the situation with mr creedon who addressed the commission the last uh, uh, time this was discussed 
And uh, you've also asked us to do a more comprehensive review of the issue of dock roofs, which we are beginning, and that will be taken up again in the future. And then uh, um, uh, the way it's drafted, again, any special permits that are issued under this ordinance must be completed and approved no later than December 31st of this year. And any dock roofs failing to meet that criteria that we've spelled out in the ordinance would be subject to enforcement at that time. Um, the other thing you would ask me to do is uh, to chat with some of the professionals in, in the world of uh, seagrass. And, and so we, over the course of the last uh, month or so, we, we, I've had the opportunity to chat with um, uh, Dwayne DeFries of the Indian River Lagoon Council and more recently with uh, Mark Perry at Florida Oceanographic uh, Society. And uh, uh, the the gist of the comments, and I let me see, I think I have a memo on that. Uh, I don't want to necessarily go over every single comment on this because it's um, uh, what I would summarize is that the, the, the key takeaways is is there's not a there's not a mathematical formula to to address if 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 a, if a particular use on the water affects seagrass there's not a there's not a mathematical to formula to say well that has a value of x dollars so so that's just difficult uh, to come by um, seagrass restoration projects what i've learned is that uh, they tend to be very localized and very specific uh, tend to be very small scale is what that means um, Large-scale mitigate, mitigation, I'm just going to highlight this. Um, Large-scale mitigation has not been successful either environmentally or, or politically, and that's the reason you don't have any, you know, any bank that you can go to and say the cost of mitigation is $500 or $5,000. Um, the other comment I've received, it's uh, rather than any fees that we collect under the ordinance, um, rather than saying seagrass per se, let's focus a little bit more broadly on the marine environment. So um, so I, I, I think at this point, um, the way I, I've come to think about this fee that we're talking about being attached to the uh, to the ordinances, rather than putting a particular fee in the ordinance, which is, it's got $500 drafted into it now, rather than say that, I would probably strike the specific number and simply add a sentence that say, a fee will be established by resolution, and that gives you more flexibility to evaluate it and update it over time, rather than hard coding it into the ordinance. And just because of that, then that means that we don't necessarily need to agree on what the fee is tonight, but uh, we'll bring it back with a resolution at, when we bring the ordinance back. Um, but I've been thinking more like $1,000 per roof. Uh, and the reason for that is that it, 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 based upon the handful of ones that we've uh, come across, it would just give enough money that it could do something. Florida Oceanographics Program it's a very nice program. Uh, it relies primarily on volunteers, and so 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 a small contribution of four to five thousand dollars over to them, you know, that'd be big money. That could you know that would add a lot to their a lot of value to their to their program. And then um, one other comment I need to tell you is um, we have in the course of communicating with members of the public and looking at aerial photos. And we have identified one additional roof that we're aware of now, in addition to the ones that you've been informed of previously. And, and it's a situation that's it's a little bit more to the south end of the peninsula and, uh, and does indeed have permits for apparently from both the town and FDEP. So there's one additional other than the ones you've been previously informed about. So. That's my overview comments. Okay, that bring us to uh, some public comments, and we have uh, we have two here. First one is uh, Jackie Fairlow Lippish. Hi. Does the clock work so I can tell? Yes. yes. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm uh, Jackie Thurlow Lippish. Uh, for people who may not know me, I've basically lived in the town of Sewell's Point since 1974. My father served as the town attorney around that time for quite a few years. My mother wrote the book on the town of Sewell's Point that many people have on their coffee tables. Um, 
The signs that you see in India Lucy, also in the park, the historic signs were put together by my mother. I served as a mayor and commissioner, a mayor for almost two years and a commissioner for, you know, within that eight time period. Uh, the reason I'm telling you all of this is because I have a lot of skin in the game and it's very important to me and that's why I'm here today. I presently am an appointee of Governor Ron DeSantis on the South Florida Water Management District. Some people consider me an expert in uh, the St. Lucie River, Indian River Lagoon. I speak across the southern part of our state on the issue often. I have a blog that I've had since 2013. My goal is always to uh, speak for the environment and the animals in the environment and for the children who will be living here in the future. Um, I want to first thank the police for uh, picking my father up off the ground when he died on uh, the 20, uh, I'm sorry, on the 2nd of April. And uh, they were so good to my mother and father. I, I just want to thank them. Our police department is remarkable. God bless you and thank you so much. Um, Town of Sewell's Point's been around since 1957, is, is right on the you know, uh, logo, so to speak, right up there. And since that time, there were no dock covers on the East Coast. There's a reason for that. There were, it, it's, a, it's a visual issue when you're at that, uh, almost at sea level. And it's also an issue for seagrass. It's also an issue when you have hurricanes and you have to repair those things. Uh, the bottom line is that the boat dock covers that are in place now, and I have spoken with your staff about this, they are not in compliance. Right before I got on your commission, a, an entire house was knocked down uh, because it was not in compliance. I think it's in poor form to uh, promote something like this because you're promoting it for the future and uh, you're setting a precedent. If you uh, disagree with me, uh, I, 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 I just don't agree. It is uh, 62175, and it is against that. I have brought a seagrass card so you can see. And also, in spite of anything anyone has set up here, seagrass is really not, you cannot regrow it somewhere. They might be growing it in Moore's Creek, but you can't grow it out there on the flats. And that's what brings value to these houses and to all the animals and the fishing. Um, there's an unusual manatee event. I have brought the numbers, and uh, I'm sure you've heard about it. Please, please do the right thing and work for our environment instead of <laughs> whatever. So um, I will leave this with you and I'll pick it up at another time. Thank you very much for your service. And you are here to protect, you are here to protect the town of Souls Point, not ruin it. Uh, Chris Creedon. Thank you, Mayor. Chris Frieden, 176 South Souls Point. Um, been in front of you guys before. I've had an ongoing effort to put a roof over our boat lift for quite a time. Um, you just wanted to put out there, I included some additional information through April today where we did do a seagrass study. I had left that out of information <laughs> I submitted before. Um, you just would like I don't know through this, if I listen to the attorney read the um, ordinance, I believe it is that you're trying to pass, you know, kind of, seems like you'd be able to throw a roof up pretty quick and, and pay a fine, pay a fee, get it brought back into compliance, which I don't think is right. That's not what, that's the spirit behind what I've tried to do is go through the right channels, get something permitted and approved. We've got we've obtained um, two different series of an Army Corps permit. We have a DEP permit. We've done a seagrass study showing there is no seagrass there. There's nothing a roof is going to do or a cover is going to do to impact something that's not there. Um, you know, for us, it's, it's a quality of life thing. I agree with uh, protecting value. I don't want to hurt I don't want to hurt anything right here. We love this town. We've not been here long. We've been here 12 years. Um, I love to fish. We love to be on the water. I don't want to 
hurt any of that at all. What we want to do is protect our investment. We want to try to increase our property value. I have to fix a sea wall that's, that's <coughs> failing. And I'm trying to coordinate all this together. So I just ask if there was a way to consider as you're making these changes, trying to bring uh, existing properties or existing projects up to code, if there's a way um, not to open it up for a complete uh, onslaught of new options, but we've been in this process for three three plus years. Uh, it's, it's nothing new. We've, we've tried to do the right thing. We've been, to an extent, at times I feel like led along. Um, but anyway, I would ask for your consideration in going forward with an opportunity for us to have the um, chance to close out this property effort. I appreciate your time. Okay, that's, um, <clears throat> those are all the uh, public comments we have on, on this item, so I'll open it up for uh, discussion. Mr. Fender. <clears throat> Vice Mayor Kersman. Yes. I don't want us to make a big mistake. I stood here at last meeting. I'm going to stand behind even stronger than what I said before. Um, I'm more concerned about marine life, our environment. That's what I ran on. And that's what I'm going to stick with. And I'm not going to reward people that did not put a permit in. I think it's a bad example. And that means everybody going forward that want to finish the radic and sneak it, don't get a permit. Later on, you could pay. We're, that's what we're saying. It's OK to do things the wrong way. And we're going to reward these people. And that's disgusting. And I think it's that's why we have rules and regulations. And I value the marine life. I moved here just as everybody at this day is did. And I'm sure everybody that's right in front of us did. We moved here because it's beautiful because of the water and to protect what we have, not to support a friend or something that might live on the water because they want to have something to cover their boat with. And as I said in the previous meeting, I have cars that were probably worth more than that boat, and I just put a car cover on it if I can't fit it in my garage or wherever I'm storing it. And that's just the reality of it. I mean, it's just, I, I'm here to protect the environment. I'm not here to protect five people, um, excuse me, three people really that have no permits. I am not under any way going to support those people. And I'd be very disappointed if we approve those people to get it. I, if we signed off on a permit, I, I could live with that, that we made a mistake. And we're going to have to live with that mistake. But the other three? to go on and say, it's OK. Go ahead now. And $1,000 to most of the people that we're talking about, that's like going to buy a cup of coffee in some situations. It's, it's, it's no disrespect. But if you're going to go ahead and do something like that, I mean, you've got to be talking minimum $25,000 for starters. And that should go to the marine life protection. There's no reason um, that a certain group of people because they live on the water, which is what, like I say, we live here to allow them to destroy the water. And I not so bought in because I know seagrass could come and go. It may not be here now, but doesn't mean it won't be here in the future. It's just like a weed, except it's in the ocean. You don't know when you, the weeds are going to pop up on your lawn. And we did have people with more degrees than we can imagine. You heard right there, as far as I'm concerned, Jackie Thurl Lippich is an expert. And these people have a lot more degrees than all of us combined when it comes to this. And I don't think we should make a decision just to appease a handful of people. Big mistake. And I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to please urge my fellow commissioners to vote no on this. I had a um, I had a question when I was when I was reading it. You, you talked about in the executive summary you're talking about the uh, dock roofs in existence on the east side of the peninsula, and the way the ordinance is written, it almost sounds like we're looking at both sides, west and east. If there's anything that's non-conforming on the west side, it would have to be taken care of uh, the same way. 
Is that am I misinterpreting that, or is that is that a correct interpretation? Well, I think our understanding was that 62-175-1, that roof height issue, the upland repairing of property by rights, really only affects the east side. I have no problem if you want to be specific and say east side. At the but same time, that same people concern. on the west side would still have needed a permit to put it up, even if it was you know still 15 feet or less. It's true. So if they didn't have a permit, I would assume that we would. This is the vehicle we asked them to go ahead and. Uh, correct the situation and, and get right. get something approved but I, I agree with you i'd rather be more specific if there's any doubt whatsoever since every conversation has been east side of what you're talking about we could put that in you know i think the um i think the the, the major issue here is um and it's something we've, we've been grappling with and really haven't come to a conclusion if we if we really feel that uh, if you're on the east side that you flat out can't have any kind of a, a, a you know, roof on their on your dock then you know that's where we are and that's where we that's where we should go uh, I think there's um, you know I certainly um, understand the uh, seagrass issue we've had we've had presentations on that and um, you know there's a lot of things that contribute to the loss of seagrass and uh, you know runoff is certainly the stormwater runoff is a much uh, much more significant problem than uh, you know an occasional uh, roof on a on a dock but i can i can understand the you know feeling there is uh, you know regardless of what you do you don't want to you don't want to to uh, damage anything i also have a kind of a strong feeling about that if we we've got agencies whether it be the uh, dep the army corps who do these kind of evaluations should we be doing more than what they're requiring? Uh, obviously, we have no choice. To, that's the minimum we have to do. But there's nothing that says we have to do more. And should we be doing more in terms of, uh, as I mentioned at the last meeting, we, won't, we don't want Jack out and his uh, fins and snorkel doing uh, seagrass evaluations where they, we've already done one. So I think that's really what the issue boils down to. And I really need to get a feel from uh, other commissioners, the the, the twenty five thousand or ten thousand dollars that Ms., uh, Vice Mayor Kurzman is talking about, I, I think that's uh, I think that's uh, a little punitive, to be perfectly honest with you. I don't think we need to uh, you know punish people. Uh, we certainly like them to contribute something to an education or a seagrass fund, uh, but um, that's where I feel about it, Commissioner Fender. So I've given this a lot of thought, and uh, and I've, I've vacillated from uh, almost as heavily uh, negative as, as Dave to uh, pretty soundly in favor in the last go round. I completely uh, agree with uh, Jackie's passion on this. Certainly, the environment is is one of our most critical assets, and and I've been fighting that for for day one. In this particular instance, I am not sure that the dock roof issue is what is impacting our environment as negatively as many other things in the building along the coast. You know, I'm a big proponent of, of protecting that Hammerhead Peninsula and, uh, and the runoff and all the, the investment we're putting into stormwater runoff into the estuary. But I'm also a proponent of, of the property values in our, our community. And one of the things that attribute to our property value is our ability to be able to use the docks that are already built behind our houses. So the question is, what is the impact of the seagrass? Hopefully, uh, we have the capability of, of protecting that and, uh, and mitigating it. I think this 500 thing is, is kind of silly. I would think it would be a sliding scale and we would work more closely with Mark and other experts to make sure that we are uh, planting more seagrass in our estuary and finding ways to, to bring our seagrass back. Uh, I really don't, you know, the question is, what's the slippery slope? Are we saying that, uh, and, and where do we stop? Are we not building any more docks <coughs> behind houses in Sewell's Point uh, because we're concerned about the, the environment Im impact? I'll listen to that argument. Um, are we concerned just about the roofs on top of the ends of docks that already have boats over them and are already blocking the sun? So I'm concerned there too. But what I, what I am not concerned, and I think what historically has been the case, is the the aesthetic aspect you know the the whole <coughs> above ground seeing the dock out there blocking the view 
I don't think we're going to block out the sun with, with views of docks. In fact, I think the docks are aesthetically pleasing to, to people who come here to look to invest in Sewell's Point and buy their homes. And more importantly, I think we have an entire governmental agency that should be protecting us in the DEP and in the great work that uh, uh, Jackie's doing on, you know, on the South Florida Water Management District. So I would say that we must adhere to the, the, the studies that they provide for us to get a permit. But once the DEP says we, you know, are <coughs> not harming the seagrass to build a dock, then I'm not sure it's within our purview to keep a homeowner from enjoying their property and building a dock on it, which I also believe actually uh, benefits the town. You know, as much as I'm, I'm concerned about seagrass, I'm not sure that the dock is what's causing our seagrass problem. That's, so I, I know that's against what Jackie would like me to say, but I, I, I sort of feel like we're also uh, harming some other people in this scenario, in this, in this particular situation. Vice Mayor Kersman? Yes. It, it, just because the state allows you to do something they permit, they also permit us where we cut down trees. Why not cut down every tree in Sewell's Point? <laughs> I, I'm just saying, hey, you know what? I, I mean, the state says you could do a lot of things. I mean, you know, the state says that we could change our ordinance and allow go-go bar right here across the street. Are we going to do that? No. Are we going to cut down every tree? No. <laughs> I mean, it's just some things, because you're allowed to do it, I mean, we're better. We're not. There's a lot of things the state says we could do. It doesn't mean we have to do it. And well, so that's my question. Yeah. Are we not going to build docks? Are we going to take down the docks that we have? No, we're, we're not, not saying docks. We're saying the, what it is, they are, there's like an awning on these boathouses. And what's happening, they will not ever allow seagrass to grow there in the future. And it's just not going to happen. And, the ones over the boats. The, the ones over the boat, yes. And, and that's where the issue is. Also, the slots should be so far apart when they have it. As a matter of fact, um, somebody sent us an email. I think it was, um, Mr. Mady, when he was in here, sent us an email that evening explaining the slots are better spaced further apart than they are closer together, which is, is something we should also look into. But we should look to improve things. And like I say, once again, I'm talking about enabling people that took it upon themselves with no permits to do this and not even to ask the town about it. I mean, everything I do, I, since I've been here, I've always asked, do I need a permit to do that? No matter what it is. Anybody comes to work in my house, do I need a permit? And it just, I'm just not taking it upon myself and they should have had the same courtesy. And, you know, regardless of what somebody said, I am not going to reward these people and say it's okay and, you know, we issued three permits and I think it's over out there. Those three people have it. I don't think it should go on. Otherwise, what's going to happen, it's going to look pretty much just colorful little pieces of cloth going all across up and down the sea line and that's what you're going to have over here. And the difference between the east and the west is if somebody didn't apply for a permit on the West, they should also have to go in and pay for the permits. We should go ahead and check and see who has and who hasn't. I, I'm, I have no issue with that, but you cannot grow seagrass on the West side. And that's kind of why we said we're protecting the East side because the water is shallow. And you know, the one thing we all love is the manatees. There's nobody up here that would want to see a manatee die. But, you know, by saying yes, it shows, well, you know, what's the next thing? I understand we have runoff, but we're improving that. We're doing projects that are going to stop this. That's why we just paid all this money on the program that, you know, we're going to wind up paying next to nothing on the, the phase three over here because it's not even matching funds. It's other funds that we have available, and we still have additional funds we could get in grants. And I just feel we continue on. We're going to make the environment a better place. And this is part of the start. We've got to look at it as a whole. It's every little piece counts. Okay, are there any other uh, comments? Um, Commissioner Campo? Out of order. I'm sorry, I, you didn't put in an item for this. So, no, you're, you're out of order. Go ahead. So we've probably had eight meetings on this. We've got staff time. We've got attorney time. I think we've really taken a deliberate approach 
to try to come up with a solution. It <coughs> would have been much easier to kick the can down the road. We had uh, two basic issues. One was the docks in noncompliance and the future permitting of possible additional. And we've decided to take a very incremental approach. I uh, applaud the uh, interim town manager to try to come up with a solution because frankly, there required a lot of courage and everyone was, you know, really not that enthused about, you know, a step to take. This I think is, is an attempt to try to stop the, the future uh, problems and to have a, a dateline that we can uh, come up with some solutions. I agree with the mayor and I agree with uh, Commissioner Fender that the DEP is better equipped to uh, survey seagrass. M many and most of the folks that I've spoke to that are in this quagmire have got a permit from either the, the town or the DEP or, or both in some cases. There's been some con controversy and uh, conflict between building officials and COVID and John Adams not returning a, an email or things of that nature. I don't think it's people sneaking out in the middle of the night trying to get things you know under the radar. And if anyone has any specific questions on the code, I'm open to that. I'm not thinking this is this the only way to handle this. But I think when this when this body comes together and tries to come up with a solution and rolls up the sleeves, I think we should keep moving on. And you know, talk about communication. We communicate a lot here, Don Weiner. We communicate a lot, especially on this topic. Is this the perfect solution? No, is it something that I know 100% about? No, but I think we should try to keep moving on. If someone sees a part of this that they think is, is incorrect, let's tweak it. But to back out when we've gone through all this work, which has basically been, I don't want to speak for anyone, but it seems like it's been kind of a four to one, let's try to come up with some resolution and to just back out of that when we spent all this time and money on it, why did we even start? Why do we even start? So I'm in favor of moving forward. Someone wants to tweak it. Someone wants to look at a certain aspect of it. I'm open to that, but I don't think we should spend all this time and effort and have consensus and have staff time and just turn around and just, you know, mothball it. Commissioner Mayfield. Uh, yes. Um, to Commissioner Campo's point, yes, we have discussed this before. I, you know, I've at prior meetings, I've said, stated my position before. Um, it hasn't changed. I, I support this ordinance in addressing the structures that are already in existence. I like that approach. Um, I also think that no additional permits should be given until and if the ordinance is changed to allow them. I think we talked about making sure the wording, so this is really just going to address the ones in existence now. Um, and then I think a positive is, as we move forward and go to the comprehensive review, as the interim town manager put it, um, it gives us the opportunity to look in detail um, and make changes for the better environmentally. I think one of the residents had written about some material you can use in your dock that lets in more light. I mean, we could become more stringent in other areas. I mean, if you look at the code, it's not that detailed. Basically, we, just, we follow the DEP except for the, you know, the item in question about the repairing line and you know, the Indian River Lagoon side. But other than that, it's not that detailed. So we could get more stringent aesthetically um, and environmentally, which I think would be a good opportunity. So. Thank you. Anyone care to make a motion? Oh, wait, wait. There was one before approving. I wanted to ask the okay. attorney about one little point. We had talked about this. It was very confusing. I'm not going to lie. I read it and it's confusing. <laughs> I think it makes sense, but item B, 62152B, um, the non-compliant roof of any dock structure in existence as of June 1st, for which the owner has, a, has demonstrated compliance with all FDEP requirements and obtained a town permit by December 31st, 2022. We were discussing changing the date so that nobody could get a new one. Isn't that kind of the theory? Does this, because if, if it says, not that they would be able to, but if something happened, it doesn't seem to make sense to leave it open to December 31st, 2022. So <laughs> what, what we've talked about is 
uh, letter B, I believe, is for the two individual docks that already have town permit and DEP permit. And if that's the case, then maybe we just say and obtain the down permit by June 1st, because they already have it. And that way it's clear that letter C only applies to those that don't have both. Unless, and this is where there was some confusion, I think, unless you want even the folks that, are, that have the permits, even if they were issued incorrectly, not to have to pay the $500, not to have to go through, you know, C1, 2, 3, and 4, the general inspection. So if you want the all of these docs to go through the $500, the um, additional fee, and the general inspection, or do you want those two that have the town permit to have not comply with that? And I think that that's what we talked about, right? Those those two aren't going to pay the $500. That's the intention, yes. So if that's the case, that's why when we were talking, perhaps that December 31st, they should be June 1st, because they already have it. It's not something they need to get. They already have the town permit correctly or incorrectly. They have it, and they already have the DEP permit. So that was the suggestion. If you want to completely exempt those two, then just change the date to June 1st. Okay. And then, okay. and then if I could, there was a comment made about, you know, you can quickly put a dock together by June 1st. I don't know how quick, how accurate that is, but I don't know if you want to change June 1st to May 1st. Okay. Seems fair. I mean, the, the reason for June 1st was the ordinance would be adopted in your May agenda, but um, this is just or, first reading. This is just first reading. So if you stick to June, then. stick to June, then. Okay. And then did we want to change the wording to uh I think the town manager already said it, changing that to a fee established by resolution. That Under, would be my uh, recommendation now, okay. yes. I think that sounds good. We'll change that as well. Okay. And then last confirmation is there are actually three docs now. Is that correct, town manager, about that have both permits? That appears to be the case, okay. yes, without, okay. yes. <coughs> and, and if I could back to the mayor's question, do you want language that specifies east side only? I feel, is that not taken care of by A, that, um, where it says whose roof height exceeds the finished grade in violation of, I mean. That's the intention, okay. and that's what I think it, that's what I, we believe it means. But if you want to do the belt and suspenders, the suspenders would be, you know, parens east side only. I don't, again, I don't think you need that. I don't, I don't think but, we need that. Okay. Can I um, can I get a motion on the um, on the ordinance for number four four two with the uh, with the modifications that uh, we've just talked about to uh, C three and what was the other one C three uh, B okay. and I think that's it B and C three okay. Sure, I'll make a motion for those um, to be approved with those modifications. To I'll, be. I'll say. Please call the roll. Commissioner Mayfield? Yes. Mayor Tom Peck? Yes. Vice Mayor Kersman? No. Commissioner Campo? Aye. Commissioner Fender? Yes. Okay. That brings us to item nine resolutions, which will back us up to, let's see, resolution number 933, budget amendment three. Could you please read the resolution? The resolution of the town commission of the town of Sewell's Point, Florida, adopting an amendment to the 2021-2022 fiscal year budget, directing the town manager take action to implement budget amendment number three and providing for an effective date. Okay, we have any discussion? Any questions on, uh, on that, that issue? I'm sorry, that, that there's a lot of zeros on that, that page. I'm not gonna, <laughs> could uh, either, holl yeah, there you go, thanks. <clears throat> yes, would you please go ahead and uh, run us through the uh, the budget amendment? The summary or the, the actual schedule? 
Uh, the, so I'd like to go through the uh, the background a little bit. Uh, as I read it, I was. Um, okay. I get. Okay. Well, go ahead, and I'll ask the questions after you. Okay. So basically, there were a number of projects that are are kind of in the process that actually were not included in the budget. So I've kind of just um, separated the big things into three sections: the projects, the carry forwards, and then other things that were unexpend un unexpected expenditures that at this point we need to actually amend the budget to accommodate. So the projects, and Mr. Hudson's going to have to jump in on some of these because I'm not that familiar with the, the details. I might know a sentence on exactly what the project is, but the um, Resilient Florida um, is the phase three of South Sewell's Point Road. So that was a grant that we're, um, we're awarded and we're in the process of go going through the process. So we have to, have to add the revenue and add the expenditure. And both Mr. Hudson and I are used to actually having a project that is a multi-year uh, project in your budget and then every year continuing that project. Um, and the reason why is because if you just have little pieces in year to year, you never really get the full impact of what that project costs. So this basically puts, and all of these items, it puts the project in the budget and then if the project is not going to be done, which we know is not going to be done in this fiscal year, we're going to be able to carry that forward and keep track of that $3.4 million into the future until the project is done. Um, and the, the American Rescue Projects are the South Sul Point Road Phase 3. I believe that's part of that um, same one. And then the septic to soar projects are the ones for town hall and commercial property right around town hall. So I think it's next door maybe. Um, a sewer line assessment is basically a, a video of the sewer lines to see what the shape they're in right now. Sh shore lines? Or sewer lines. Sewer, sewer, sewer lines. lines. Sorry. Where's that, sewer. Where's that accent from? <laughs> <laughs> I'm from New Jersey originally. So I grew up in New Jersey. So. What accent? Um, at the end of the turnpike, <laughs> 18. <laughs> Sounded like that. Yeah, um, I'm at the very end. <laughs> um, the next one is the um, money to put be put aside for the acquisition of 78 Seals Point Road. And we don't really know what the cost of that acquisition is going to be. But based on the resolution that you had done early in the budget process, and I think it was maybe 922 where you... Um, dedicated 0.4 mills to road projects, that's the calculation to come up with that 0.4 mills. Um, and after discussion, and thanks for Commissioner Mayfield, the budget was put in for $330,000, but the math actually was is only 279. And the way that they put in the 330 was actually for the rollback rate. So it would, be, would have been the difference of the amount of money you had gotten the prior year versus what you're going to get in the, in the current year. But then the resolution actually specified 0.4 mills. So there was a little bit of a disconnect there. Um, when we look at the budget, my exhibit A, you'll see the 330,000, but I couldn't, I truly couldn't figure out where that 330 came from. And then, like I said, uh, Commissioner Mayfield and I talked yesterday and she was able to provide some insight and um, I did the calculation and that really is the math. Is, is that they had the 330 was from basically what the tax um, amount you had collected the year before to what you were going to be assessing in the new year. But then the resolution actually says 0.4 mills. So again, it's a little bit of a disconnect. So we have to go with what the resolution says. Um, okay, the vulnerability assessment. I don't remember exactly what that is. I think that's just a risk assessment on for the soar to septic is that right joe i think it's a storm that's a storm water uh, one. Okay. Storm water. yeah oh okay okay <laughs> oh that's good. good you're here because some of these are your projects okay so those are the kind of capital projects that again some are going to be from year to year they're going to be multi-year projects uh the next two are carry forwards and there these are two different situations that we had the first is um, there was a public works vehicle that was ordered in fiscal year 2020 that actually did not arrive until um, October of this year. So because it arrived in the new fiscal year, 
the auditors had done an adjustment and moved it from last year to this year. So we basically have to, had to expend it in the current year, but it was actually budgeted to last year. So that's really kind of a carry forward amendment that we have to do to recognize the expense in this year. The next one if, is- If I could just add an editorial comment onto that one too. That's one of those items when you were questioning about the abnormal, that's one of those items that shows up as abnormal and this budget amendment will correct the abnormality. Um, and then the next one is also similar to that, except it's a little bit different. So we had actually bought a police car last year, put lights on the police car, but then through, I guess, transitions, not really sure, the bill didn't actually get paid for the light bars. So again, we got a bill um, in the mail or an email, you know, it was basically almost nine months old and it had never been paid. So again, we had to pay that bill. Um, but of course, the, it, there was no budget. It was budgeted last year. It was expected to be spent, spent last year, but it wasn't. We, have to, we had to write the check this year. So we actually have to adjust the budget in order to, to accommodate that. And then the last three are what I call unexpected projects. Okay, so one was during the budget process, you had budgeted for the comprehensive plan for planning, but there was no money put in for current planning projects. So we had done an analysis and the current planning projects are gonna run around $20,000. So that's um, Bonnie um, Landry, no, Land Bonnie Landry and Associates. And, okay, so it's work that she's done or their associate, that firm has done on current projects that come up. So that adjusts that budget so that it, that money is available to, again, we pay some of those bills. Because when you look at the budget to actual, you'll see that it's almost spent, but we're only halfway through the year. Uh, the next one, of course, is the town manager recruitment. And then the last one is the bridge repair, which we, was discussed, I believe, at the last meeting. Uh, which, again, so the uh, repair was needed to fix something. We have to actually amend the budget to, to do that. So we approved the expenditure, but we didn't actually amend the budget. So that's kind of a um, summary. And then I just kind of summarized it into the budgetary, the budget impact. OK. Commissioner Campo. I was on from before, I'm sorry. Okay. Mr. Fender. So uh, thanks for this. Uh, I'm probably gonna ask some pretty high level questions and also maybe some difficult questions, I'm not sure. I, I feel like I've lived through now three staff transitions through uh, you know what I would consider to be pretty massive expenditures. And, and when we started down the, the path of South Sewell's Point uh, uh, renovation, let's call it, uh, it looked like it was going to be a daunting, very expensive project. So I asked Pam, then uh, town manager Pam Walker, to uh, try to build a business analysis case that looked forward many years, so we could see what the impact is to reserves, what you know, how you know what the impact could be to tax, how, you know what would have to be offset by grants, you know. And, and there was a model that was built. And when that, then when the next staff came in, they didn't really embrace that model so closely or you know they they had their own plan and I'm sure it worked very well uh, but now I'm looking at this this number and I see that we have we're, we're dipping 662 into reserve so again I'm back to I need to understand what the business the long-term business impact and 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 the recovery plan is for how we're going to embrace this. And I, I'm sure, you know, you guys have spent more time looking at this than, than I have. So I'm hoping you'll, you know, I'm, I'm a graphical person. I, I like to see charts and, and lines. And so, you know, one spot on a, a, a chart, which is a budget amendment, concerns me a little bit when we're talking about, you know, well, I'll say millions of dollars. So you, you, I'm hoping you're gonna make me feel better about how we're, you know, long-term, the next year looks like after this, you know, given what we should happened to us last year and the, the, the sizable grants and what Mr. Weiner mentioned is, you know, our, our responsibility of the matching funds. So I hope we, we have a business, business process, a business plan uh, on how to conquer this, this is a change in philosophy because from what I've observed in the town, the history has been to approve a contract and then one or two meetings later come back with a budget amendment that somehow says this is how we're going to pay for the project. Okay, and so this is trying to get a handle on, on the, the 
phase three, we can just talk about that. So, you know, so it's a $4 million, $4.4 million project as we understand it now. So 3.4 of that is coming from the Resilient Florida grant. Uh, 257 is coming from ARPA. Um, the 78 South Sewell's Point land acquisition, that's 279. So all of that builds together to come up with 4.4 million. All of the money on, certainly the, the, the top pro process, uh, the top part, the projects, that's all the money that we've identified the funding already in the, in the, in the um, accounts of the town. The other half of my answer is I think the place you want to see that business model is in your capital improvement program. That's where you line out all of the major projects that you have going on for a five-year period, and you adopt that once a year. What is different in, from my experience, the way the town has done that, what you would normally do is you would normally appropriate or you would budget for that first year of the CIP in your budget and you have not done that in your past experience and so we have to come back in now and amend the budget to incorporate those items that were <coughs> actually reviewed last summer that are in your CIP. I don't think there's hardly anything on here that you haven't uh, you know previously uh, I, looked at. I think at, you're so. right. I just uh, it's so. been a while since we talked about yeah. it. So I, I, I you know I see the term utilization of reserve 662,000 and I'm trying to figure figure out what that means and uh, if it will need to be replenished, if it will be replenished. And, and part of the use of the servicing, you know, the, the millage rate increase was the servicing of uh, funds to help meet this obligation. So I, I'm trying to connect the dots between this budget amendment and what our real uh, business yeah. model is for meeting our obligations. I'm going to turn to Holly now to, to yeah, so back, part of the, dig back in. Yeah, part of the 662 is the 279, which is the um, land acquisition, potentially, which is the 0.4 mills. Okay. That, um, again, the math equals 279, but when you look at the budget, which, again, in, in, in Exhibit A, and this is where you know I personally couldn't figure out what the number was. Is they actually budgeted 330,000? Um, it's on the second page of the exhibit A. Um, you'll see that they budgeted 330,000 for capital projects. And when I had you know first got here and, and looked at this budget, I couldn't figure out where that number came from because it was not the 0.4 time your taxable value. So, um, but like I said, I think what I determined with uh, Commissioner Mayfield's help is, is that it was actually considering a rollback rate to the, your current rate, which again is a different number. Um, so that's what a 330 is, but the utilization of the reserve, so 279 of the 662 is that reserve you had set up. And then the other ones actually has to do with, an, um, you know, the last time you did a budget amendment, budget number two, it was for 449,500 Dollars, but when it was approved, it wasn't approved as a balanced budget amendment. Um, and that was also for some stormwater improvements. So some of it, is my understanding, was, is exactly what Mr. Uh, Commissioner Fender said, is those carryovers were from last year because they had some project that, and it is on my sheet number one, this um, HMPG4283, that we received the cash this year but the money was actually spent last year. But then they did a budget amendment to recognize the money, the revenue in this year. But unfortunately, under governmental accounting rules, if you receive the money, the money within 60 days of the year end, and it was for an expense for the prior year, it actually has to be in that prior year. Understood. So that amendment number, I think that was amendment number two, and then they, did an amendment, and that was amendment number one. Then they did an amendment number two, um, adding the expense for that 267, but it sounded like me, you had already spent the money in the, in the year, prior year. Um, so then we have to now reverse that amendment number one because the auditors came in and said, no, it should have been last year. So it, it, there's a lot of um, moving around here that we're trying to fix. <laughs> yeah, there, there's some correcting going on. Yes, there definitely is. Well, I, I'm not, can I, may I continue? Yeah, sure. I, I'm not really trying to put you on the spot. Oh. And I think I'm probably providing a big ask for an interim staff, but uh, 
I'm wondering if it's possible maybe in the next meeting or two that there's a way to get this in a little more, gra you know, it might be better for me to see it in some kind of graphical graph format that, that I, I'm trying to understand what the impact yeah, I is could do to it. our we, we can Yeah, we can do that for sure. Yeah, there's no, there's no rush to get this done. It's just, yeah, so yeah. if that's the, the desire of the commission, so. Yeah, I mean, I could do a, a graph. I mean, typically well, not. Okay, like, that I would. It would be really appreciated, and be as creative as you want. But I, I guess I'm trying to get a sense of what is the impact to our reserve. Right, and that's what I was going to say. Like during the budget process, um, I typically would have that graph as part of your budget presentation, mm -hmm. and I didn't see anything like that when you all did your budget presentation. Mm -hmm. But you would typically have show the historical change right. for like five years, and then a projected that's of like right. five years, um, and based on your CIP, that would definitely be something that's doable. Oh, uh, and, uh, you know, based on the CIP that was adopted last year, we could do that projection. Give it a try. See if you can come up with something. That'd be awesome. Mr. Mayfield? Uh, yes. I had a lot of long conversations with Dan and Holly about this, so um, I feel pretty good about it. I mean, there's a lot of correcting and accounting going on, and I think it's all good stuff to get us straight. And yes, the reserves are affected, and but we have big projects going on, um, and maybe this will help. I know it's not relevant to this. This is all good, but we do have the other half of the ARPA money coming that is pretty much guaranteed. So that you know, in terms of having when you talk about depleting reserves I don't know if you mean just accounting or cash whatever but if there's something like that, that uh, there's the ARPA money and then um, I don't know if this is I thought we were going to hopefully get reimbursed for the purchase of the lot I don't know if Joe if that is correct. If one of the grants is that correct or there there was the grant which, which uh, are you talking about 78 yeah yeah, yeah there, we have a grant that's pending that we don't have final approval on one point seven one point six million dollars right. which is part of phase three and you know we're optimistic you, we, we did have a conversation with FEMA last week and we expect we're expecting some kind of approval to come out within 30 days right. or so again nothing to like do guarantee you know this is all good and correct and we need to pay attention but I just wanted to help us thank you, you feel better that there are yeah. other things in the works is that would you say that's an accurate statement yeah. Dan? okay sure okay that's all I'm asking for okay. I feel better <laughs> <clears throat> I had a, I'm sorry, go ahead, Commissioner Campo. If you had a comment, go ahead. I was going to move the approval of the uh, budget yeah, amendment. I have a three. couple of questions, not necessarily yeah. comments. I wanted to make sure I understood the uh, projects here because uh, my understanding was, you know, we've been looking at the uh, ARPA money and we had, uh, I remember that specifically we addressed the uh, vulnerability analysis for $100,000. That was one thing that we definitely approved ARPA money for. Uh, we also approved ARPA money for the um, preliminary design report. And I'm trying to remember ballpark. What was that? 130,000. Yeah. So is that where is that here? Is that um, that's under item three? Under item that. three is 200,000. 130,000 of that is for the preliminary design report, and the 70,000 dollars will go to pay the town share of converting the town hall to sewer okay okay and then we so that's 200 and then today we approved the um, sewer line assessment the $35,000 that was in the consent agenda today and that Correct. was that was ARPA money as well so I, I guess I, I guess the only one I'm, I'm still confused with a little bit was the uh, the uh, phase three ARPA money for um, South Sewell's Point Road Two hundred and fifty-seven thousand dollars, and I—that's—I I may just have missed when we did that, but I, I was confused about that. If you could square that away for me, I'd be very happy to move move on. All we were suggesting there was just to put two hundred fifty-seven thousand into the phase three, so that we could. Let's say if the um, if the FEMA grant did not come through, got stonewalled, we would still have some cash there to make the property acquisition. That really is it. Re really relates to the property acquisition more than anything else. Good. We've re have we received the first five hundred fifty thousand on the ARPA yes. funds. Yes. Last last year, it's sitting in deferred revenue on your balance sheet. Okay. And when do we expect to receive the uh, the next? 
the next shot, the next $550,000? I'm not sure if I heard, but um, there is a report due that later this week, so I think that after that report, um, we'll get a better feel for when it actually is going to be coming, because I don't recall seeing if I, when, when they said they're going to release the second tranche. I have been kind of expecting it any day, because it was about the same time last year that, that the first tranche was uh, distributed, so. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Vice Mayor Kersman. Yeah, one of the things I know that we have is when the permit fees that we've taken in, and if I'm correct, part of that can be used toward road improvements, which would qualify for part of phase three, which would also help close the gap. It, so can you tell me how much we have currently? Um, yes, I could tell you how much we have budgeted and what, how much we've expensed we've cut, collected this year. I'll go back to the financial statement. Um, yeah. There's actually a separate revenue Right here. 162. It's a lot of money. Yes. Uh, in the current year, we had budgeted 162,500. And so far, and again, this is only mid year, we've collected 158,618 dollars. Go Jack. <laughs> Woo! Shout out. <laughs> that, Shout out. Uh, part of the money that we've collected in that can go toward road improvement. Am I correct on that? I, that, I believe so. I mean, that's it's, the intent of which the would be that is part of phase three. So whatever we're short there between that and also if we wind up selling the lot on heritage, if, if we do that along with the money that we're getting in grants combined, we'll wind up paying zero at the end of the day and there's not even a matter of matching or anything else then we could worry about phase two which would be pineapple to henry sewells and that should be our next focus this yeah. part is really going to cost the town nothing and i do want to make that clear there's we're not coming up with a million dollars or anything it was done it'll be done the smart way we're we're going to be scot-free at the end of the day. And that's what kind of everybody wants to hear. And then once we, if we get this, repeat the same thing again with phase two, at, at that point, um, once everything's paid off, everything, the tax increase is now sunset. It's no longer the tax increase. Everything goes back to 2.87 again, which might be a few years down the road, but not that many. No pressure, Chloe, no pressure. <laughs> that's... Mr. Mayfield? Uh, yes. One other thing I just wanted to say in our discussions we had, and if I remember correctly, um, when I started as commissioner and other times, if there was a budget amendment, oftentimes we would uh, lower an expense because we'd say we weren't going to spend that much more in that certain account. So I think this is a better way to do it. I believe she's not lowering any other expenses anywhere. It's just going to the unrestricted reserve. So then at the end of the year, if you do come in under expense, that amount will be lower. So this is a more, I think, a conservative, better approach than kind of just assuming you're going to spend less in certain expense areas. <clears throat> that is, in fact, true. And, the, and what um, Commissioner Mayfield said um, was one of the questions she had asked, you know, at the end of the year, in a private business year, you're used to seeing it like all year, what your, your net income is for the year. Here, it kind of, you kind of see it. It's just your revenue over expenses. Um, but at the end of the year, anything, you know, any revenue that you receive over your expenses drops straight to that undesignated fund balance. So um, it's, it's a good thing when you don't spend the money that you have budgeted. Um, a budget is just a planning tool. <coughs> you know, basically, if you don't really spend the money, the budget is, is, is there available to spend in case something comes up. But at the end of the year, if you haven't spent it, it's going right to that un undesignated reserve. Okay, Commissioner Campo. Well, first of all, I want to thank Holly. I don't think that we've seen you in front of the lectern, so thank you for your great explanation. Thanks for being here. Thanks for backing up Dan. And I want to uh, move approval of resolution number 933, budget amendment number three. I'll second. Did we read that one, April? We did. We did, okay. Please call the roll. Vice Mayor Persman? Yes. Commissioner Campo? Aye. Commissioner Fender? Aye. Mayor Tompak? Yes. Commissioner Mayfield. Yes. Okay. And the next, uh, let's see, the next item is the um, resolution 
number 934 meeting scheduled for the remainder of the year Could you please read the resolution a resolution of the town commission of the town of stools point florida approving the establishment of the day and time for a second regular monthly town commission meeting providing for conflict severability and an effective date okay is there any uh, any discussion on uh, on this item move to approve second uh, please call the roll. Commissioner Mayfield? Uh, yes. Commissioner Campbell? Actually. Indisposed. Um, I, I can't stop in the middle. I... Okay, keep going. I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Mayfield? Keep going, keep going, and then I'll bring it up. Yes. Vice Mayor Kirsten? Yes. Commissioner Fenton? Aye. I'm sorry, I didn't do my homework, and I didn't look when Thanksgiving is, and I was looking at just so I apologize for that outburst I won't do it again <laughs> <laughs> okay that brings us to uh, item uh, 10 old business declaring lot 7 heritage way is surplus and initiate zoning change resolution number 935 uh, could you please read the resolution a resolution of the town commission of the town of Sewell's Point Florida declaring 7 heritage way as surplus real property and directing staff to initiate the rezoning of the property to residential providing for conflict severability and an effective date and for other purposes mr hudson yes thank you uh, you would ask us to initiate uh, the sale of this property and so the first one of the first steps to do is declare it surplus uh, which this resolution accomplishes and the other step is to initiate a zoning change um, the zoning change would be from ps1 to r1 and it begins with this step it's about a 30 to 60 day process um, it, it's governed by florida law um, uh, we re we're recommending since it's a zoning change that that during the course of this process that we do engage the lpa so you, we would ask you to meet one time as the lpa uh, to consider this and we're looking at a based on the noticing requirements, the first tentative hearing date would be uh, June 14th based upon the noticing requirements. And in the meantime, um, we actually have already kind of kind of mapped out of the marketing and bidding procedure. So, so, but we'll bring that to you whenever we're a little bit deeper into the, into the process. So this basically starts the process. Okay, we have some public comments on this one. Uh, Jackie Thurlow Lippish. Thank you for starting the clock. Uh, for those of you who may read um, Sewell's Point Magazine that Don Weiner brought up earlier, uh, the most recent article that my mother wrote, historian in Sandra Thurlow, uh, was about uh, an 1883 survey that was done by a, a chief surveyor, Kelowna, in, as I said, 1883. And I just wanted to read part of this, <clears throat> and then I'll make a comment. The prettiest land on the sheet is the peninsula lying between the St. Lucie River and Indian River from Mount Pleasant, which is in the Riverside Park, south to the point. It's high hammock land with coquina foundation and covered with a heavy growth of hardwood and underbrush with now and then a pine and it goes on to say that this was the most beautiful, the prettiest land along that whole side from uh, you know, north of here onward for, for Martin County. Please do not damn a tree when you just did a resolution for Arbor Day. You are in a position to create a park which should have been done with that tree long ago which would also um, raise the value for the properties on that street. You only have to put a bench, make it available. You cannot replace the tree. You cannot replace the tree. The greatest way, I believe, to have value is to protect what you have. You don't try to create something new. You maintain and you protect what you have. We are one of the prettiest places on the east coast of Florida. And some commissioners are quickly unraveling that so that we're like everybody else. 
I don't want to be like everybody else. I want to be like the town of Souls Point, a very special place that even in 1883 was considered the prettiest part of the St. Lucie Indian River Lagoon in Martin County and part of St. Lucie County. Please have honor what we have here. Honor what we have here. That is where you get the true value. It's not, in, the number one thing is taking care of what you have. You cannot replace the trees. You cannot replace the water. If we want to be like everybody else, why don't you just dissolve the town and we can be part of Stewart or Martin County? Souls Point was always considered different, almost like Jupiter Island. Not to be elite, but to be absolutely beautiful. And that is why the properties are more valuable here. I beg you not to kill that tree after you just sold the seagrass down the line. Thank you. Don Weiner. Don Weiner. I, I'm a little more passionate than Jackie. Uh, that lot was purchased, purchased under my administration along with a few others. Um, we didn't purchase that just because we thought it might be nice. We purchased it because there's a tree, oak tree there that was a couple of hundred years old at least. And we purchased it as a drainage area. Now I'm sure the town attorney has advised you on the contract that was signed with the state at the time as to what the requirements are if you no longer use it for drainage. But as Jackie said, you just approved an Arbor Day resolution talking about us being a tree city. And here you are going to cut down one of the most beautiful trees we've got. That's hypocrisy. It, 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 anyway, at its worst. Um, General Code. You know, always, always the, the position of the town and the town commission was to strengthen the town code. <clears throat> Whenever we saw something that needed strengthening, we did that. We didn't make it more relaxed so some people could get what they want. We saw the motorhome garage built on just south of here. We said, okay, that doesn't look good, let's change it. We did a lot of changes. Minimum lot size was changed from 15 to 20, 25. It's now 30,000 square feet. Houses and, and buildings uh, additions were torn down because they didn't have a permit. And you're going to worry about a few hand dock roofs? This is all part of that. You can't replace <coughs> public lands. We've got very few public parks in town. Very few. We've got this one across the street. You've got some at Rio Vista. This is a nice place. It's a beautiful place to be. And you're going to cut down this beautiful oak tree for the sake of a few dollars? because you need it now to do a project? That makes no sense, absolutely none. And, and I could go on, but I just get aggravated more and more. Thank you. Oh, one other thing. In our commission, and most others, after the commission was through with their discussion, we always asked, is there any further comment from the public? Thank you. Carol Chantos. Carol Shaughness, South Souls Point Road. I'm the other side of the coin. I think it should be sold. Now, I appreciate people who think it shouldn't. I do. I, it's a beautiful tree. It's a beautiful lot. But there's, did you know that there's 13 people, I talked to the tax assessor's office today, who have lived in this town for more than 25 years and they're on a special uh, discount on their taxes because they make less than $32,000 a year. They're the minority. If the majority who wants that property thinks that it's so good for our town let those people get together and buy the lot from the town and designate it as theirs or private space or whatever. But 
there's plenty of people that are, it's going to be a hardship with everything that's going on this year. If you watch TV, you know that everything that you bought last year on a regular basis is going to cost you $5,000 more this year. Gas, food, etc. What about these 13 people? Where do they stand? I'm sure they're really happy that your hand's in their pocket and that's going to make it harder for them to buy food and pay for gasoline and pay for their necessities. I've told you folks for over a year that the financial situation in this country is bad and you should tighten your belts. And here we're arguing about a lot. There's some big bucks in this town. Let those people put their own personal money and let them pay for it if they want it so much. But don't put your hands in the pockets of the people who have struggled to live here for all these years. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, do we have any um, discussion? Um, Vice Mayor Kersman? Yeah, this is a tough decision. It, it's not easy, but part of the uh, well, uh, it's sad because for years that lot's been not kept up. Nobody on the street has taken care of it. The tree was in dire need of help and it's been neglected for as long as I can remember, unfortunately. And at the same time, you had some of the people who were for the tree, but yet they were against the tax increase for the project. And you can't, it's impossible to do things both ways. And there were tough decisions that have to be made. And one of the things you can do, you, and Mrs. Chancellor's brought up a great point, to get a group of people or a certain person will name the lot, that we'll call it a park and name it after that person if they want to buy it. And it'll be their property. Um, it would be honorable for people to do that, but you know, to go out when you have, you want to preserve something, the best way to do it when the town, it's not just a few dollars, you're talking about $700,000. And it's, we're trying to do something so eventually we can revert the taxes back. I know that a lot of our residents were up in arms. I was for the tax increase to get this project done. And I, at the same time, if we could get through this, we're a good point once again would be to try and solicit some people. There are billionaires in this town that probably would love to buy that. And that's something we could look into. So it won't get developed, and that would be the best of all worlds, and they might even take care of the tree and put some money into preserving it. But at this point, it's difficult to keep that and continue on. To, uh, I have to say at this point, it's a hard decision. You know, I, um, I'm going to... I'm going to agree with you, Dave, on this one. This this one's uh, one of the toughest ones we've looked at. I, I keep, um, you know, in terms of the uh, property having uh, value to us, you know, because it's not in an area where it could be used as, a, uh, as an STA, I don't think it necessarily has a lot of value. But also, and it's, it's, it's burnt into my mind uh, what we went through last year when we, um, you know, decided to uh, modify the, uh, the millage rate. And when you look at how much that millage rate increase brought us, it really wasn't as wasn't a whole lot of money, but boy, it was a whole lot of pain. I can tell you that for sure. <laughs> and as I look uh, as I look to the future, you know, it looks like we're in, we're in fairly good shape for the next phase of the uh, of the stormwater project. But there's going to be there's going to be other phases after that. Who knows how the um, grant money will continue to flow or whether it'll start to dry up when and then a new administration takes over and you know I almost I almost think about hey am I trying to put 
you know, a value to a tree, you know, and I, uh, geez, I don't want to, I don't want to be doing that because uh, I have a lot of feelings about, you know, the same things that we've talked about, you know, we just, like, like it was brought out, we talked a, a resolution on, uh, or a proclamation on Arbor Day, and the next thing we're talking about is, uh, you know, cutting down a tree. And I assume, and I think we've talked about this in the past, that uh, there is no way to develop that lot without cutting the tree. I mean, I, I've looked at it myself. I'm sure we all have looked at it, and man, it's damn near smack in the middle of the lot. So it's really, there's no work around there in terms of, uh, of leaving the tree. So, uh, but I look at, you know, potentially $700,000 and, uh, you know, for a town that has um, essentially no capital budget, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's an awful lot of money. Commissioner Campbell. Yeah. I knew that this would be a controversial issue when it came up. And so I called my friend Jackie Thurlow and I said, we've got an opportunity to protect the river with an STA and we're basically buying a lot of the same size, basically trading a piece of property, a third of an acre uh, that's right now not useful to us for the water filtration and we're trading it to another spot. We're not just spending the money to blow money. And I remember, Jackie, you said, I don't like it, but I won't fight you. And I took the courtesy and time to explain the situation because it's a difficult situation. We have a lot of different things that Do not we put words in my mouth, James Campo. Do not put words in my mouth. You can say what you believe, but don't you put words in my mouth ever. That was a conversation that we had. I don't care. Do not quote me on the dais of anything. Okay. I wouldn't have done something as controversial without having consulted with someone that had such deep thoughts on the topic. And you know, this is a tough. This is a tough. Uh, this is a tough action for us to take. No one likes to do it, but at the end of the day, we're you know, we're supposed to be stewards of, of the uh, real estate and the, and the money. And I think that this is a trade-off between one piece of property that's very useful for the river. And I think this commission should be proud of all the commitments, all the capital improvements, and all the blood, sweat, and tears that we've been doing in order to improve the most sacred asset that we have is is the river commissioner mayfield uh, yes <clears throat> i think i said this at the last meeting when we talked about this but this isn't something i support right now you know we have very few amounts of public land in sewell's point it's hard to come by it's valuable um and there of course there's the tree on it and you know the real estate is such a valuable asset right now and cash is less valuable right now um, so it just doesn't seem like the smartest trade when in particular um, you know we are able to meet the short-term demands for these projects so i i won't vote for this one okay do we have any other uh, any other commission comments no i'll move approval second Please call the roll. Commissioner Campo? Aye. Vice Mayor Kersman? Yes. Mayor Tom Peck? Yes. Commissioner Fender? No. Commissioner Mayfield? No. <clears throat> and I assume, um, um, Glenn, this is really kind of the first step, you know, as, as we go through the process that would most likely be conversation on the rezoning portion of this as we move along yeah the many steps I mean this was the first step uh, declaring a surplus then the next step as Dan mentioned uh, at an upcoming meeting will outline the plan for the sale so we've had conversations about that simultaneously we'll be getting that rezoning process and you should be having that uh, I'm not sure if it's the next meeting or the one after that but you should be having because there are the timelines that you gotta <coughs> account for so this is the first step of probably three or four and ultimately you'll if you go down this path you'll ultimately receive bids and then decide whether to accept those bids or not okay thank you uh, next item is item 11 which is 
new business. We've got a couple of uh, public comments, although I think Jackie has left, but uh, Don Weiner. <laughs> Before I forget, if you would return those copies of the newsletter, they're all I got. Uh -huh. Just give them to April, and she can leave one in town hall in case anybody wants to come and look at it. Um, one of the things that every commission has res wrestled with is whether to name anything in the town park after anyone. And the position of the town has always been, there have been a few exceptions, there have always been streets are never named after anyone. Like I said, there's a few exceptions. And nothing would be named in the town park because it's like, where do you start and where do you stop? You could put a hundred names in there of people who have done service to the town, valuable service to the town, uh, going way back to Kiplinger and Carnegie and a whole lot of others. Um, Mr. West, I thank him very much for his service to the Highway Patrol. I think it's terrific, but I haven't seen him do anything for the town and to put a full-blown statue up. Well, if that's the case for $100,000, I'll give you $200,000 to put a statue up of my wife and I holding hands. And I'll give you another $200,000 to have statues of Barack Obama and Donald Trump holding hands. Where does it stop? You can't, you can't really name anything without creating a problem. And uh, you might look, there's a, a couple of plaques in there. I know one for Billy Eskew, who worked hard for the town, and a couple others. But my suggestion, don't name anything after anybody, because it opened Pandora's box. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dan, would you go ahead and explain the item and uh, talk about the options for us, please? Uh, yes, sir. We were uh, approached by a resident recently who offered to donate $100,000 uh, for the park, for the town commons, in exchange for permission to place a statue of her late husband in the park. Uh, the town doesn't have a policy specific to donations. You do have a naming uh, policy, but not a policy relating to this kind of donation. I, I'm not aware that there's ever been anything similar brought forward in the past. Um, uh, the town clerk and I met with Mrs. West, and she's here this evening. And if you had any questions for her, but that's not if that's not necessary. Um, in the absence of a policy, uh, there, there's three ways we could go. Uh, at a minimum, we, you would want to have a donor agreement if you want to move forward. That would spell out all the terms and conditions, and this is where it's going to be placed, this is what our obligation is going to be, this is what uh, your obligation is going to be. Uh, the other thing that you might want to consider, and I think would be recommended by the attorney's office, uh, would be um, drafting an ordinance governing donations so that you can address the situations of what are you going to do with the next statue of uh, Mr. Weiner and his wife holding hands or Donald Trump and uh, and uh, President Obama holding hands. Uh, but, you know, we, we speak of it facetiously, but there are some fundamental issues involved in those kinds of things. You know, you need to be prepared about how you are going to respond to the next request. So, um, and then the other thing is, you know, I would love to have a town committee to, you know, just take a look at this. You know, this is one of those things that, you know, from a governance perspective, you know, begs to have a committee. But you can do, I would say, you know, at a minimum, you know, if you want us to move forward, we can simply treat this as a single example and work with Mrs. West and come up with an agreement that would satisfy, try to satisfy all of those uh, concerns and move forward. Or we can take a broader view if we think there may be more in the future. I, um, you know, one of the things that we've been um, we've been trying to do is to uh, is to get more uh, more residents involved, and uh, this might be the uh, opportunity. I mean, we have some folks that have done some work on the park in the past, and I don't see why we couldn't, uh, you know, have that committee, um, you know, take a look at this and make some recommendations to the uh, commission. I think we've all received some email from uh, Diane Kimes with uh, a lot of a lot of information there where you know she could certainly help and uh, um, like I said give the give the folks some uh, opportunity to be part of the process here rather than just 
for us to uh, make decisions. Vice Mayor Kersman? Yeah, I, I was going to suggest also that we probably have Diane Kimes get some more information for us and get her input and see where it goes from there. Or how would you like to have a statue over on Seven Heritage? <laughs> uh, we could definitely do something there. We could even name the we could even name the park after him over there. <laughs> Can you come up to the uh, podium, please? <laughs> Mrs. West is a bit shy, so just. Uh... on Apple STEM CM, and I especially thank you and thank you for helping me to come here and speak about my husband. I think what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of doctor, architect, what I mean you name it, very prominent people been live here. But I don't believe any state trooper lived here since eighty seven. And so I think the statue make with a head and uniform gun and I, my husband is around six one feet tall or a little tall, I'm not sure, but I think a kid's going to be real mire and I think that's very educational for the kids also. But there's so many that, okay, uh, Dr. Henderson or Joe, it's so many doctors where Kids, okay, my father's doctor, so what's special? A trooper is, I think, is different. I really think it's good for the kids to eat. A lot of kids here these days, long time ago, we didn't have that many kids. But I think the park's very um, more busy, I don't know what to say, but uh, if you all commissioner um, consider, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think what uh, what we should do is to um, <clears throat> provide Mr. Hudson with some direction here. <laughs> Any other comments, Commissioner Campo? This is a no-brainer. Okay, we don't have to make it more complicated than we need to. Finally, rather than people saying that. Um, you know, the town should spend money. This is a resident that wants to make a contribution. I think we should keep it as simple as possible. Thank you for the honor. Thank you for the story. It's uh, what history is all about. And I think we should keep it simple and let the town manager work on this isolated situation rather than turning it into a total volume, multi-episode. Um, this is very gracious and, we, and I, for one, really appreciate the respect that you're showing us. Okay, so essentially you're saying you uh, recommending that you uh, uh, direct staff to develop a donor agreement. No, that was the first option that... Yes. yes. Anybody else have any uh, comments or input? I concur. Commissioner Mayfield? Um, yes. Um, this uh, I was surprised by this. I was happy to see this. I, I you know, the playground... <clears throat> needs maintenance, the, somebody being generous, donating that amount, I think that's awesome. I think there are a lot of opportunities. Um, I, I love your idea and I love your explanation. I, I personally, I do not think that individual statues are the way to go. Um, I, I think we, we're small, more of an opinion aesthetic thing. It has nothing to do with the, um, the role your husband played and I think there are other ways to honor. That's just my personal opinion, I think that it's a bit of a slippery slope with individual statues. So I wouldn't recommend A at this point. It would have to be discussed in more detail. I do like the idea of a committee. Um, I think this is a committee that people could um, really get on board with. So thank you, Mrs. West. Um, and that is how I feel. Okay, so we're, we're not giving any, any good direction here at this <laughs> point. Uh, I, I kind of think that um, you know, it would be very nice to, um, you know, just handle it as a donor agreement, but, uh, you know, what happens six months from now when the, when the next request comes in? So it, it sounds to me like well, we... Well, that should be part of the donor agreement, right? 
Well, I think we're talking specifically about a donor agreement with Ms. West here, right, Ms. No, West? Yeah. Yes. It does, but, you know, uh, would, every, would every agreement be the same, essentially, or? Well, they would certainly all come before the diet, so. Okay. Um, well, what's, what's, the, what's the pleasure? You know, Dave, you want to weigh in? Uh, I would let um, Mrs. Kimes look into this and see what she comes up with, or, like I say, Seven Heritage is still available. Yeah. We could definitely do that, but I just... Well, can we can we agree to have um, Mr. Hudson develop a donor agreement and get some input from uh, Diane Kimes? Is that would that work for everybody? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would work well. Okay, very good. Uh, next item is uh, staff comments. Oh, I have something for you. <laughs> okay. Well, oh, not that. We uh, uh, placed a, I wanted to give you an update on the uh, manager search. Uh, we've been in communication with uh, uh, Mercer the last day or two. Actually, uh, actually today I took, chatted with her on the phone. And so um, it's time that we can start looking. I like to look a few weeks out into the future when we're planning agenda items. So um, the... I have a calendar up on the screen for you. The application period closes this uh, later this week. Um, they will have, uh, she's going to plan to email the resumes for the well-qualified candidates to the commission the following Friday by the close of business on that Friday, May 6th. Um, she did give me, you know, some us, me and the commission some words of encouragement that she's uh, she's pretty ha happy with some of the resumes she's seeing so far so so that's uh, good news to report um, the question is uh, would you be prepared then the following Tuesday to choose the finalists you have a regular commission meeting um, on Tuesday May 10th and we could e incorporate that into uh, into the Tuesday regular meeting if you would like so um, if you feel that like that's not enough time for you to speak with her she does encourage you if you when you get them and have questions please just call her directly and she's happy to chat with you um, so if you're if you think that would be enough time we could just plan I could just tell her to, to plan to be here on the 10th and and uh, pursue it further and then looking on down the road a little bit um, we have Memorial Day coming up, so so we have to kind of, she recommends keeping it away from the Memorial Day weekend, either you're going to be gone or candidates are going to be gone, so so we're looking at either the week before, uh, either the 22nd and 20, 23rd, uh, uh, she recommends a two-day process, so there, you have copies of that uh, on your, uh, in front of you. I don't want to go into a lot of detail. I know it's late, but basically, the first day is is the first afternoon is spent kind of with the staff doing you know getting showing them around town, and then in the evening you would have a meet and greet with uh, the public, the candidates, yourselves, and in just kind of an informal setting, just to kind of casually get to know each other. And then the second day would be a combination of interviews. Most likely scenario would be in one on one interviews with commissioners, followed by group interviews. So, so that would be the day two. So we would be looking to do that either the 22nd and 23rd or the 3rd and 4th of June. You're on schedule, so I don't think the, the timing of either one of those matters too much. Um, if you did the 22nd and 23rd, uh, you have then a, a regular meeting the next day, so you wouldn't have to make a decision the same day unless you wanted us to schedule that. So. So I guess the threshold questions are, can we go ahead and plan to do a, a finalist selection on the 10th of May? And then which of the two suggested dates would you prefer to do the, the candidate uh, meeting and interviews? So. And we're lighting it up. Commissioner Campo. Maybe you can back up. Maybe I wasn't paying attention as far mm -hmm. as uh, 
whittling down to the finalists, um, what's the process? Like, how many applicants are coming through? Is she weeding out like the Domino's pizza delivery guy? And then yes, okay. So yeah. how many? What, what's what's the time frame as far as the finalists? And have we chosen a number? Five, ten? I mean. Is there a sequence? Well, I, I think she recommends a minimum of three for the finalists to do interviews. I don't think you want to get much more than five because then it would become okay. kind of unwieldy. I think she'll give you a list. We don't know how many will be on that list because it's still open as we speak. So okay. we'll, we'll have a better idea. Yeah. You know, so she will give a list. And let's assume for a second that it's 15 people that she names she provides to you. So. So then your task would be on the following Tuesday to say, which of those, which three of those, or which five of those do, would you like to interview? So. Okay, so mm, I'm still unclear, I'm sorry. So she's going to give us a list of how many and say, will it down to three or five? I, I, didn't. I don't know if there's a number I can ask. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. So she I mean, has I, number in mind. I think I don't want to be short-circuited as the commission to the point where all we see are three. I think that's that's uh, fast forward. Um, it's, it sounds like the way it's being explained here is that uh, Mercer will send us all the qualified candidates, and then we'll get the opportunity between the uh, sixth and the tenth to. Uh, um, decide which ones we think should be finalists. Is that the, the only thing I would add to that is that she's going to send you the well-qualified applicants, right. the best qualified, not, you know, someone may be technically qualified but may not be the best applicant in her judgment. So, yeah, but, how many, but that may be. Roughly, how many would you expect that to be? It's it's. I, I didn't I didn't think to ask her how many she had in hand. I think if we're if you're asking us how much time we need to review them, I kind of need to know how many I'm reviewing. If I'm reviewing five. Maybe I could do it in three days, but if I'm reviewing 15, I think I need more time. So well, that's, that's really what I'm looking at, if, okay. especially if we have another meeting agenda in addition to that. You know, I mean, well, I don't want to blow. I need more. I need more than four days. Basically, I need more than four days. Okay. Well, then yeah. you know, we. You I, can, I, I'm not going to blow my whole weekend. You know, glued to 15 applications and come back on. Until well, then let's pick an alternate date. Yeah, let's yeah, do that. yeah, that was kind of the gist of my yeah. question. Is yeah. that enough time? The gist so. of my answer. <laughs> <laughs> so you could either do it later that week, either on a Thursday, or you could do it the following Tuesday. I think. Yeah, I, I don't want you to feel rushed. I mean, it's this is your process. Your well, if they're gonna if they're gonna come, if they're gonna like visit <clears throat> from farther away, I, I would think the 12th would be better than the following week. If if we were looking at. Um, doing the interviews on the 22nd and 23rd, which I believe is what I would prefer. Um, yeah, all of the dates move, obviously, as you move the dates. So, so. Uh, oh, OK. But you, you have the option of the 12th up there. I was yeah, that, I think, the I'm, that would be my suggestion, okay. yeah. I'm getting a sense Dan's really looking to. <laughs> he's, he's got one foot on a banana, he's got one foot on a banana peel. Slow the sick down. Well, I'm wondering if we could, um, you know, depending upon how many we get, of course, we could, we could, ha we could have maybe a special meeting either on the 12th or the 17th, and in that case, we would do the uh, alternate candidates day on the uh, 3rd and 4th of June. Uh, Is that no, it's fine. I'm, I'm just going to say that I, I'm still a pretty strong uh, proponent of having some kind of quantitative data, other than just a chat, to make some decisions on this person's writing ability, their personality assessment, their, you know. I thought that was part and of it. I thought you were going to talk to her about it. Uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, she, I have spoken with her that about that specifically, and, um, and um, she does include, intend to include that as part of the evaluation process. She will do that um, probably on the three finalists or the five finalists, whichever number you settle on, not on all of the candidates. So if that's satisfactory. That's fine. So. Yeah, I think we did it for the last 10 or 20 the last time. Okay. But, and, and let's also remember the folks that are not familiar with the process that will show up you know then the last night and want to have us redo the whole thing so i i guess we're going kind of um 
freestyle here, Mr. Mayor, but what, what are we doing to communicate this? And I know that this, this is something that you were felt strongly about, and you're the one that's going to get the heat. What, what do we need to be doing as far as telling, you know, the community, hey, we're getting close to this process and tune in and, you know, pay attention because the, the number of people that show up at the last minute and come up with s information that's inaccurate, it's, it's you know, uh, something that we want to avoid, let's just say. Yeah, I thought that uh, when we initially talked with, uh, with Donna that the, um, you know, the consensus was that the meet and greet was the, uh, the best way to get the, uh, the residents involved, but I have no problem in doing it uh, in a different fashion if uh, you folks have any suggestions. You know, we would certainly wouldn't, you know, we'd certainly only want to, um, you know, have the meet and greet for a limited number of uh, candidates, you know. And I think that's, that's why, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with, or maybe it'd be a good idea if, you know, to, uh, you know, contact our constituents if there's any specific questions that they would like us to ask during the interview process. I'd certainly want that, you know, that kind of input because we certainly know uh, what, you know, some of the issues are that, uh, you know, folks are concerned about or would like to know what the uh, an applicant's position is uh, specifically on those those issues. So I, I think um, the meet and greet's a good idea and, um, you know, there's nothing that prevents us from individually talking to uh, residents or, you know, about uh, the qualifications of the candidates. Okay, well, I know we're... I have one. Good. Can I say one more thing before it comes out of my mind? I don't want to have, I don't want to get emailed on a Friday. I'm sorry, April, but I want, I want, you know, three ring binder with, you know, as much organized as possible. I don't want 15, 20 page documents of everyone's life story and birth certificate. So when you see email on a Friday night, again, I'm, I'm not going to sink a whole weekend and be well, ready. Well, let, let's Tuesday. do this then. Based upon that comment, I would recommend that we move the alternate, move the uh, selection date to um, the 17th rather than the 10th, because that will give us time to assemble a regular agenda like we normally do, put it out on the internet, create the three ring binders, and, and have uh, lots of people that have, can come and have understand what's it, going on be. and not jump in at the last minute and, <clears> and, uh, mischaracterize things we don't want that we want as much buy-in we want as much public comment I mean we have a lot of people that spend a lot of time and we want that and once we move forward you know we're gonna be moving forward so I like that I, I think we should probably give us give ourselves until you know 10 days or so to, to have that process I think four days is is not long enough and then and another question, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm but are we, are we entertaining out of state people and talking about paying their travel? Cause we did that last time. And, you know, I, I, I don't know that we ever were decisive enough with it's uh, customary to pay travel expenses for candidates. Right. So I understand that, but if they're coming from out of state, that has another aspect. If you're trying to book, you know, flights within a week, for a round trip and hotel, that adds a lot of expense, especially nowadays where every seat is booked and the flights are really expensive. So I don't know if, you know, we've even talked about, you know, having out of state applicants. Well, I, I think you do that in, in, as your selection process when you're choosing who to interview. And if that becomes a criteria that's important to the commission, then you simply don't put them on the list of finalists. Okay. So. And it's my recollection we didn't rule out <coughs> the state candidates. Yeah. I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Mayfield, did I? Um... Oh, no, that's all right. I'm, I'm ready now. Okay. Um, I don't know if it's possible, but I think I had mentioned or we had mentioned when we were talking about the town manager months ago about a survey of what are the most desired traits in a survey among the residents. That seems fairly easy for a um, straightforward way for residents to get involved, also kind of a way to get them notified this is happening of, um, you know, things that they desire, like a simple, you know, not too, too difficult, but then they can drop it off at town hall. I think that would be... I don't have one ready to give you on what it would look like, but. 
It sounds like you're volunteering to make one up, though. No, I'm not sure that's what I'm saying. <laughs> hey, you, there was a lot of talk about involving citizens when we were when we um, were talking about the prior town manager's contract renewal. So this is my effort to you know hold hold true with that. We talked about that a lot. So I think this would be a a good way. I could certainly help. Do you think that is something? Well, your vast it's, experience it's, in running it's, cities. It's it's doable. Um, you know, we have this constant contact that we have that has mm -hmm. email addresses for everyone who's registered, which is, the, I think, almost all of the town residents. Um, the The tricky part would be crafting the survey itself. Do you want it to be free form, kind of open ended, or do you want it to be kind of a forced choice? Or I'd you know, have to the, those are you know, there's a lot of science mm -hmm. involved in you know in survey design. So I was hoping so that's one a, had been a done. Free before. form would be easy. You know, you just yeah. put out a few general parameters, and if you if you wanted to get something like that, and you know, I could ask uh donna you know if she's yeah. ever worked with something like that before so okay at the same time it, we could ask you know at the same we could ask them if they had any specific questions on issues that they would like the uh oh that's a, yeah uh-huh yeah any the particular process. questions okay vice mayor kersman yeah i sort of like the way we did it last time we crammed everything in in a short period of time and we were able to stay with it. It was, you know, I'm not saying do it in just a week or two weeks. You know, it could be over a three week period. The other thing is, I'd like to be part of the process. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be in town from the third, probably till the 15th. Mm -hmm. I, one thing I've never done is miss any meeting we've ever had here since I've been a commissioner. That would be the first time I'm going to miss a meeting. The third and 15th of June, by the way, or June. not May. <coughs> Could we, uh, well, we can, you know, these dates are all flexible, so we could move it up to the June 1st, 2nd time frame. Of I like the weekdays. They actually work out, well, no, there's no more school then, but it, um, that's fine. I can do the 1st, 2nd. Did we do a weekend last time, too? Yeah, it worked out pretty nicely, I thought. This is May. Well, the, yeah, the, the problem is the Memorial Day weekend is in the really kind of in the middle of our, our yeah. timeline here, so. Let's, let's start with the date. Yeah. She'll have the finalists. She'll have the finalists yeah. on the 6th. Yeah, yeah, okay. so. So that's one yeah. given. And we can fix this as the as the date for the the seventeenth, based upon that, and then that gives us time to fine line the. Uh, <laughs> I would like to get it done before Commissioner Kersman goes on vacation. So. Okay, so then we we have a begin date and we have an end date. Yeah. Okay. okay so we if we progress. if we work on that, you know, kind of the two ends of it. Uh, that still, if we if we make the decision on the finalist, that gives two full weeks for uh, Donna to do the background checks and the HR and also all of this time you know if you want us to do the survey the citizen survey also then there's plenty of time in there to do that and compile it so. and it would give a time for travel arrangements and yeah, travel arrangements and off. yeah and if we lock in these dates tonight anybody who thinks they might be traveling you know can go ahead and lock in those dates so yeah I like I like I like those dates we have a lot of stuff going on so yeah it would be nice to yeah so am I hearing then, I'm hearing the 17th for the, mm -hmm. for the choose the finalist and then June 1st and 2nd to uh, uh, do the individual interviews. Right. Okay. Mr. Fender, you have something to add to that? Uh, I, I will say that uh, I'm, my button's pressed for the next conversation, but I'll, I'll be out of town uh, the 15th. The 11th of June through the 5th, that was the week of the 11th through the 15th-ish, whatever that week is, I can't tell anymore. Of June. But, uh, of June, yeah. So I think this will all be done by then, but just so you know, I'll be in Alaska, so it will be very handy. Uh, okay, I think uh, got... I'm, I'm sorry, just say the, the 11th through? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, okay. The 11th to the 18th. Yeah, we will have to negotiate a contract in that time frame in there somewhere so yeah, just trying to help us plan okay it'll be hard for me for the okay event. okay so then what what specifically would we be doing on the 17th we would be taking the finalists from her 
from Donna. And then if any of us had like a real strong feeling, hey, I think we missed one, we might add it in. And is that basically what we would do on the 17th? No, I, I, think, no the, I think what we're doing on the 17th is she's going to send us all the qualified candidates on the 6th. And on the uh, uh, 17th, uh, we're going to narrow that down to whatever number of okay. finalists we want. Yeah. They, on, on the 10th. No. No, that one no you're not. The 10th is, is off the table. Well, the 10th is off the table. <laughs> yeah. So we're we're only no. dealing with the... Right. Okay. with the alternate okay. date at okay. this point sorry okay. uh, the normal procedure in selecting finalists is each one of you let's say each one says names three people that you might like to interview okay when you put all of those together you're going to find that a bunch of them are the same individuals and maybe they're maybe it ends up being five you know when you get everybody's tally counted and so that, that that's you know it's a pretty straightforward process right and Donna can help walk you through it too so Okay, so that's what we're going to do on the 17th. We're going to take the list of, I'm just going to say hypothetically, 20 well-qualified candidates. And we're going to narrow that down to three or five that you want to interview. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Right. All right. Any, and, uh, well, I did, yeah, well, John, I know that was a long staff comment. <laughs> uh, one final thing on the ribbon cutting I just uh, we do have that set up we're going to meet here and do the do the uh, formal part here and then we'll also have a tram courtesy of the city of Stewart to to uh, run people down that haven't seen it for some reason and want to go take a look at it you know, we Thursday, have at 10 Thursday, 10 Thursday at 10 o'clock so we're actually going to be cutting a ribbon uh, well, we're searching for ribbon and scissors right now, so. <laughs> Chief knows where it is. I think we've got multiple, we've got multiple ones on order now, so. Chief's got it in her utility belt. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay we have any, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we're, we're debating who gets to hold the ribbon, so. <clears throat> okay. Could I just ask, uh, Glenn, did you have a comment as yeah, the staff? I, I was only going to ask, I'm, I'm assuming that on the May 17th, when you're narrowing down that you don't need me here for that happy to be here but That's i'm not birthday. sure you're going to you should be here I, I, mm. i'll bring a cake but okay. <laughs> but if you're going to be going through and Who's saying birthday you know oh. from these 20 we're picking five i think you're wasting actually your money to have me to sit here while you're picking i'm not i don't have any say in that process agree yes that, i agree uh, well my question would be you know with your vast experience in south florida uh and you know you you run across people and I think that it would be valuable for us to have you more included somehow in that process. I mean, you probably work with more town managers than all of us, you know. And I think if, if so, how do we? Get I'm that? sorry for jumping in, but if you if you want to, when you get your candidates, you're looking at the resume. You know, he's available by phone anytime. Okay. Okay. That's what yeah, we could I know do. Anybody else? Certainly. I mean, I've certainly spread the word. Anybody that I know, I've let them know you're looking. So I, I put the word out there. Uh, yeah. These are former friends or soon to be former friends of yours. Former friends. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then if, also, for my calendar purposes, for June 2nd, when you interview people, would you like me at that one for the interview process? That to me is a more normal time to come because there could be questions. But I just I, I, I don't want to not show up yeah. when you expect me, or I don't want to show up when you don't. So so no on May 17th, and I'm seeing not this still on June 2nd. Hmm? Okay. Is the 23rd still? Yeah, because um, <coughs> question issues. Right? Should that still be highlighted? Like right. questions Maybe you can get. Don't worry. Uh, okay, we're down to. Uh, no, no, that's going to come off. Want to do one we'll talk about it. Eleven. Dan, I, I, I know we've already been over this, uh, but I just wanted to try it one more time because I, I got a little distracted there. Uh, the, 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 the breakdown of sequence from 20 down to five. Yes. I'd like to throw it out. We don't have to do it. I'm not passionate about it, but I, I would like. I think it makes a lot of sense to take 20 to 10, get quantitative data on 10, whittle the 10 to 5, interview from the 5, right? I just think if you, uh, if you, if you don't get quantitative data on a big enough pool, you, you may be making a decision to get to 5 on a, on a set of criteria that may not be quantitative enough. In my, in my mind, that's just my perspective. Okay. I mean, I mean that would... You know, if you just on a really practical basis, yeah. you know, I'm not saying it's good or bad, but it adds a step. 
Okay. It goes at a so step. I, the I, last I, I step, you know, which adds time. So, uh, but that's that's the commission. It, it, this is your process as a commission. So, so you get to you know spell out idea. all the details. So, what if we just asked her to whittle it down to ten, and then she could just you know give it to them, and then we would go from there, as opposed well, to doing the whittling from twenty to five. She could just give us ten. Well, that what I'm point is is I would like to see oh, yeah. eight on ten. Is what I'm saying. Not okay, and then she, okay. we could do the yeah. I, I I think that's a way of managing it and keeping the timeline yeah. steady. So yeah, okay. Is there, is there a reason for us to ask Donna to be at the uh, May meeting, the May 10th meeting, so we can have some procedural type questions like this? Because you know we're putting Dan in this position, and he's not really. Well, I think Donna should be here. Yeah, for the on the 10th. Uh, it's just as it's a regular commission meeting. Instead of the 17th. In well, addition to. In addition. To the yeah. Oh yeah, we can ask. I mean, I think it's time to kind of brush up on mm -hmm. things and have her yeah. give us okay. our game plan and say you know this is what I found and people are really interested in you know having you know ping pong tables as part of a benefit or you know I mean we need to kind of get briefed a little bit I think get her I think so. <sighs> Commissioner Mayfield I thought it was from before I think I'm off on a new topic now. Are we done with that one? <laughs> yes, I think we are done with that one. Okay, I, I would just like to commend the staff and certainly Chief Tina for the uh, Easter extravaganza uh, a couple weekends ago. I thought it was a, a great event, and I'm super appreciative of the, the community it brings to the town. And, and, and I just thought it was amazing the amount of kids, the, 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 the camaraderie that was there, and even uh, Commissioner Campo and his mask. It was, it was wonderful. <laughs> Uh, the uh, thanks for all the hard work you do every year, uh, Chief, and super. And, and Peter Cottontail. Well. And, and Peter Cottontail, <laughs> of course. Was yes. Jack? Was Jack the Easter Bunny? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks, oh, Jack. I didn't know that. Nice <laughs> <laughs> work. The secret's out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't know either. <laughs> no, it really was a nice event, uh, and we appreciate you holding off the rain just long enough. Yes. It was tight. Yeah. Have any other? Commissioner Campbell. Yeah, I just want to thank the team. I want to thank Glenn and April and Jack and Tina and and Dan and you know we've those are the folks to me when you look at the personality profiles and you're sending them around. Those are the types of people that I think the qualities that we're looking for: servant-minded folks, professionals. I mean, we've done a good job of compiling a pretty good team. And I would even add the commission. I mean, we're about to. Uh, cross Sewell's Point Road with septic to sewer for the commercial. And I think that's a win-win for everyone that's along this corridor. I think it's a good family-oriented settlement and something that everyone was looking forward to. We're not cramming anything down anyone's throats. I want to thank and, and again uh, um, congratulate uh, former Mayor Mayfield for bringing home the bacon. And we're going to bring some some old septic tanks you know offline into centralized sewer and we are doing more for the environment for the river uh, we're doing more for trees including uh, the tree mitigation fund and standing up for a a a, a wrong uh, tree cutting I mean this Commission has a lot to be proud for as far as supporting all of the three things the, the the police department the i'm sorry four things the police department the rivers the trees and the pocketbooks and balancing all that is not an easy task and i want to take my hats off to all of you because i'm proud to, i'm proud to serve with you really and it's been a pleasure to make as much progress as we've had especially with some of the turmoil that we've had in the, in the past couple of years with COVID. so it's a pleasure to work with you likewise there are no other uh, commissioner comments, so I have a motion to adjourn. Motion made. We're adjourned. Thank All you. Right.